Hi, everyone. I hope you had a good break, break and enjoyed the first two talks. Um, I'm Lizzie. I'm from Salzburg, Austria, and I will talk to you about drawing and how you can bring drawing into the web and animate it with SVG. So we're going to have a little adventure. We're going to go first to Drawing Island and talk a little bit how drawing compares to coding and programming. Then we'll learn more about SVG, what it is. We'll also hear a little bit about accessibility. And in the end, we'll go to the animation cliffs, where we'll take a hands-on example and animate it. So let's start off with drawing. So I started drawing maybe two years ago, and I got this little notebook. And I thought it wasn't very good, but I brought this notebook everywhere and just did little sketches. And the more I did it, the better I got. And that's how I got into drawing. So I wasn't really good. I just like, did it a lot, and I got better. So whenever I do a new illustration now, I start off with inspiration. And I did a little illustration for this conference. And I kind of like just took references from the internet. I lo looked up what's interesting about St. Petersburg. I, I really like the church. I also found this like um, ballet dancer who was one of the best ballet dancers um, of the 20th, 20th centuries. I also liked uh, St. Petersburg, uh, the Peter CSS design. And I just looked through things and thought about what would be interesting to illust illustrate. And if we compare that to coding, inspiration really um, compares to analysis of like user requirements, of what problems you have in an application, what you want to solve. And you can look at other applications. And before you start coding, you should analyze what you actually want to do and what your user needs. So inspiration analysis is kind of similar. Then after inspiration, I just do some sketching. I'll use a regular pen and just draw out my ideas, see if it works, see if it doesn't work. And since paper is a really uncompromising medium, you kind of, ha kind of have to think beforehand what you're drawing. And you're, it's not as easy as on a digital um, iPad or something, because you can erase very easily. But on paper, it's a little bit different. And sketching, um, well, it compares to like structure, thinking about structure in coding. So we, sh we should think before we code an application how we want to build it, which components we need, how the components are grouped together, how they're connected in a logical way. And that's very, very important before we actually start. And then comes my favorite part, which is the inking. So once my rough sketch is finished, I'll do the inking. And often the sketch doesn't look very good. But then when I'm inking it, I can see like how the lines work. And I can see where I need thicker lines. And then it looks really, really cool. And I really like it. So this is always my favorite part, because afterwards, it looks a lot nicer than the rough sketch. And. Yeah, I'll let that finish. That's kind of what my ink looked like for the illustration for the conference. Um, and inking, well, for co it's the coding itself if we compare it. So inking is like where we actually like craft the thing. And when we code, we're also crafting something. So you start building different components. And you connect them together in a logical way. And then you test them to see if it works. And when you're inking, you're also just seeing, figuring out if like your sketch is working and if everything is good. And it means you need to work and practice. Like Because it's crafting something, the more you do it, the better you get. And it's the same for drawing as it is for coding. So in the end, like artists or illustrators or designers, they're very similar to developers in that they glue together different ideas to like one drawing. And the developer, they glue together different components to like one working application. And then artists, they try to find simplicity in their ideas. And developers, they tend to find structure and complexity. And then the artists, they find inspiration, everything around them, in movies, in, in their surroundings, just by living. They try to find inspiration in everything. And developers, well, they need to analyze different situations. They need to analyze the users. They need to analyze issues. 
And then in the end, they both craft things. So artists or designers, they craft drawings or designs. And developers, they craft applications. And at the end of the day, an artist often tries to master simplicity, whereas a developer tries to master complexity. So they have like their own process, but it, you can compare a lot of things that designers and developers do. So that was my first part on drawing. Now we're going to head on to SVG Rock. So I, I created a drawing, and uh, now I want to turn that into SVG code. And I do that mostly by scanning it, but you also could just like take a picture with your phone. I've also done that before. And that's what my finished drawing looked like. So it had like the church and then different elements from the PIT CSS design. And once I, once I have that drawing digital as a JPEG or a PNG, I'll load it into Adobe Illustrator, but you could also use another tool that can image trace. So Adobe Illustrator has a really cool option that's called Image Trace, and it has a lot of options. So it has advanced options you can use. So what I would go for is like a black and white mode, and then I'd open the advanced options, and there you can play around with like paths and corners. And that's important because you don't want to create thousands and thousands of paths. And then I play around and I look at the numbers in the bottom to see how many, how many paths I have and how many anchors to keep the number low, because in the browser you don't want to have too, too many paths and too many anchors. And I play around with that until I'm satisfied. And once I like traced my image, what I do is I need to split it up in different layers. So every element I want to animate later, I have to put on its own layer. And what's also important here, if you look at the layers on the side, they all have their own color, is that you name them here. Because how you name them in Illustrator is um, how you're going to um, animate them later in CSS. So these names you're going to use later in CSS. And it makes a lot of things easier if you choose correct names here in the Layers panel. And then the next thing that's very important if you do SVG for the browser is not to save, as, save it as SVG, but to export it as SVG. And then you get this export options. And in the top, you have the styling. And I mostly choose presentation attributes, but you could also choose inline CSS or internal CSS. And then there are other options for like fonts and images you have within your SVG. And once you exported it, you kind of like get SVG code. But from, the, from Adobe Illustrator, there will still be a lot of text markup you don't need in the browser. So after you exported it from Illustrator, you should run it through SVG OMG. And it's a very good online tool. You can um, just load SVG files. You can copy and paste SVG code. And it has a lot of options on how you want to optimize your SVG. And you can play around with it. You can look at the code. And it's very, very useful if you're working with SVG in the browser. And it makes a big difference. So for my image, it's, it tells you how much how, how the size changes. So for my image, it almost was half the size than before. So it's, it's re really important to keep your SVG sizes low and optimize them. But let's talk a little bit more about SVG itself. So SVG stands for Scalable Vector Graphics. And you should use it for having scalable responsive images um, to reduce file sizes if it's the right file format. So for vector files, it's a lot better than like PNG or JPEG because it's smaller. But then for a whole a photograph, you would probably use JPEG because you should use the right file format. And what's really cool about SVG is that you can style and animate it with CSS. So it's very powerful because you can use CSS to do a lot of things with SVG. And then you also get debugging in the browser. So every element you have in the SVG, you can look at in the browser and remove and interact with it. And um, it's also cool for accessibility. So we're going to talk a little bit about SVG accessibility. So Accessibility-wise, um, it's better to use inline SVG, because then you have access to the elements within the SVG. 
And then you should think about, well, is it a decorative image uh, or does it need like a description? So if it's something the screen reader doesn't actually need, what you could do is add area hidden true and then the screen reader wouldn't look at it because it's just decorative. But if it, it isn't just decorative, you should definitely add a title to the SVG. And the title always needs to be the first um, child node in the SVG. And it should actually work like that, but there's still like browser issues. So to make it um, work for all screen readers, what we need to do is add an area labeled by. And to the area labeled by, we provide the ID of the title. So we give the title an ID, and then we add an area labeled by. And then if you, for example, have an animation, you could even provide a description on what's happening in this animation. And then here it's the same thing. You should provide an ID to the description, and in the area labeled by, you'd give it the title and the description. And if you don't want it to your SVG to be traversed by the browser because it's just an image, you could add roll image on your SVG, so then the browser wouldn't transverse the whole SVG and all the text elements within. But if you have text within your SVG, you can add roll group, and then the browser will tra traverse your whole SVG and even read like the text elements within the SVG. And there's a really good ar article on CSS Tricks um, called Accessible SVG, and it goes really into depth on how to handle accessibility with SVG. So now we optimized it, um, we exported it, and we kind of what we get is an SVG element. It has a view box, and then we get a group for each layer we had in our illustration in the in the Adobe Illustrator. And I want to talk a little bit more about the SVG view box. So every SVG element has a view box, and this view box, for example, it starts at 00, zero on the top left, and then it's 200 wide and 100 high, and then we can scale that whatever size we want in CSS. So we could say, well, in, in CSS, this SVG is like 200 pixels wide. And then since we have access with CSS to all of this, we can make it responsive. So we have the exact same element on another screen. We say, well, it's a bigger screen. It's bigger than tablet. We want it to be actually 400 pixels wide on a bigger screen. And you can scale that however you want to. You can also do percentages, a AMs, whatever you want to scale it to. And that's where it gets very powerful. And this, what's also important concerning animation with SVG Viewbox is that we have to make the Viewbox as wide as we're animating elements, because if we animate elements within the Viewbox, if we move them outside of the Viewbox, like the black puzzle piece on the bottom, it gets cut off. So you always have to think about how much space do I need in my animation and then make the Viewbox the right size for this animation. And well, yeah, SVG and CSS, they're good friends. They work together really well. There's a lot of good things you can do with SVG, and you can change colors and do a lot of very powerful things with SVG and CSS. But then if you think about animation, SVG and CSS transforms, it's very, it, they're very, they have a very complicated relationship because there's a lot of cross-browser inconsistencies. So if you animate within uh, SVG and animate CSS transforms, you have, you're going to have a lot of issues. So there's a really good article on it, what, what the actual problem is, but a lot of browsers work different with transform origin, with like pixel-based values. Zooming in Safari is hard. So animating CSS transforms within SVG is still very hard and not normalized. So what we can do if we want to animate um, the different groups within our SVG is we could use an SVG animation library like GSAP. It's a very powerful library that has its, it's not tiny, but it's very, very good because it works across all browsers and it has very good performance. But if we're going to want to go the native way and just do like a little animation, what we could do is a little hack where we split our groups into several SVGs. And as long as we don't do CSS animation within the SVG, but on the SVG element itself, um, it behaves like a normal DOM element. So it's easier to animate, and we won't get all these crazy issues. <laughs> 
So how we do that? Well, we have an SVG, we have several groups within our SVG, and we want each group to be in its own SVG. So we could just copy paste that into several SVGs, or we could just simply write some, some JavaScript to do it for us. So we, we would get our SVG element and get the parent of our SVG element. And then we'd, loo we'd loop through all the children of this SVG ele element. We'd clone our SVG node and then app append the loop where, the app append the child we're at. And then we'd append this new SVG node to the parent. And then what we also could do is add a CSS class on our SVG element. So to our new SVG element, we'd add the da data name of our of our group, so then we'd ha we'd could we could interact with um, the CSS class, and that's what it would look like. So we'd get several SVGs, and then I have a class for the channel SVG, and then I have like it's in a BAM syntax. I'd have the different layers as a BAM modifier, and. I want to talk a little bit about using CSS variables for animation because they're very powerful, and Yuna already talked about that, that they're amazing for animation, different things. And that's what it, wh how you define a variable. So you could define it glo globally with dash dash and the variable name, and then whatever value you, you need. You can define it locally on a class or on an element. And the local value always overrides the global value. So now the button would be deep pink, but if you want to use this variable, you can y use it on a CSS property, use the var keyword, and then the name of the variable. And since the local value is overriding the global value, it would be deep pink. And then we also have access to CSS var variables in JavaScript. So we'd have an ele element, we'd get the element style, and then we have different function functions with the set property function. We can set a CSS variable on an element. With the get property value, we can get the value of a CSS variable. And we can even remove variables with remove property. And why are they so great for animation? Well, they're easy to debug. Um, we don't have excessive DOM manipulation because CSS variables are always inherited. So if I define them on a parent, all children nodes would have access to this variable. And so they're DOM node independent. I don't need to change every style on every element, but just can add a variable on the parent and then use this variable of the parent. And I can adapt them locally. And what's really great about them is that you can transform individual properties. So if you did CSS animation before, Animating CSS transform can be very tedious because you always need to put every translate and every scale you have on an element. And with, with CSS variables, you can transform that individually, and it's, it's very good. And the support is really good. We already saw that in Eunice's talk. Um, you can totally use them if you don't need to support IE. And now we're going to go into an example of how we can animate our illustration. So first, what we, what we want to do is add a mouse move event. So we do that by, we, we're going to add the mouse move <coughs> event on the document. And then we get an event. And this event has several attributes. What we're going to need the e client x and the e client y. And if we look at that, sorry. Um, we see it's like pixel values. So our client width is 900, our client height is 620. And that's hard to work with in CSS, so we're going to need to do some calculations. So what we could do is we could divide our client x through our client width. So what we then would get is a value from on x from 0 on the left to 1 on the right. And on Y, the same, zero on the top and one on the bottom. Um, but that would mean in CSS, if we multiply it later, that we'd have no transform on the left and the full transform on the right. And we kind of wanted to come from the middle, to have zero in the middle. 
So now what we do instead is with e client x divided by client width, so this is a value from 0 to 1. Then we subtract 0 0.5, so we get a value from minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5. And then if we multiply that by 2, we get a value from minus 1 to 1. So that's what we actually want. So on the left, we have minus 1, and on the right, we have 1. And then on the top, we have minus 1, and on the bottom, we have 1. And it's very powerful, because we can do all these different calculations in JavaScript and then set it on CSS variables. So here, we get our x, we get our y, and then we set our CSS variable on the parent element where all the SVGs are in. You should always try to set CSS variable as locally as possible, because since they're all inherited, you don't want to other elements to, to change, and it's more performant if they're more local. So we added our mouse move event. But now nothing is moving yet. We're just setting the variables. Nothing is happening. So what we need to do is to apply CSS transforms for these variables. And we set them first in JavaScript. Our, in JavaScript, it's going to be a value from minus 1 to 1. And then we can set them in CSS, and we're going to do it on transform translate. In CSS animation, um, we had yesterday by Anna doing CSS transform is the most performant way to animate, because it's on the composite on the last step. And how you use CSS transforms, you'd have transform, then translate, and then you'd add a value for the x-axis, and then a value for the y-axis. So here you translate 20 pixels on the x-axis and then 20 pixels on the y-axis, so 20 pixels down. And now we want to include our variables in that. So what we can do is multiply our variable, which is a value from minus 1 to 1, times 20 pixels with the calc keyword. And we could do this by hand for all of our layers. But that's very tedious, so you'd c you, you could use sus maps, which are very useful. And what I did is I added the layer name for each element I wanted to transform. And then I added the value I wanted to transform it to. And then I'd loop through the sus map. I'd give this class I have the, the key of, of my sus map, and then I transform, I translate it times the value defined in my sus maps. And so this is all auto-generated, and it's not that long for multiple layers. And this is kind of what one, one class would look like. So it's simple code in BAM. And this is kind of what it looks like now. So it's kind of like parallax. It's transforming. But we want to make it even better. So what else can we do? Well, we can add request animation frame. So add request, add request animation frame is good because it's a function that the browser can optimize. So animations will be smoother. Animations in inactive tabs will stop, allowing the CPU to cool down. Uh, it's more battery friendly. And it's not necessary if you're using the Web Animations API or GreenSock. And you can use cancel animation frame to cancel it. So this is kind of what request animation frame looks like. So we don't call a function directly, but we call it within the request animation frame function. And then we'd animate something in our function. And then in the end, we would call it again. And it's kind of a recursive function. And then it would keep animating. And. That's our example. So we ha we'd have a mouse move listener. And instead of setting our CSS variable in our mouse move listener, what we'd do, we'd move it in a separate function and call that function with the request animation frame function. So then we'd update our DOM in a more performant way. OK, so we'd make it more performant. And the last thing I want to talk about is adding linear interpolation. Because linear interpolation is a little animation trick. That's a way to make your animation a lot smoother. Instead of jumping from A to B when you move your mouse, um, you al always just go a fraction of the way on every frame. And it converts linear check movement. And there's a really good Copan article on how it looks like. 
And this is a pure function that does interpol linear interpolation. So we'd give it our start value and our end value. And our start value would have an x and a y. And our end value also would have an x and a y. And then we calculate the difference between our start and an our end value. And then instead of adding the whole difference between those values to our start value, what we do, we'd only add 10% of this distance. So we ev on every frame, we only go 10% of the way to our end, end value. And this is kind of what it looks like. So that's without a linear interpolation. And that's with linear interpolation. I hope you can see it. It's a lot more smooth. So this is like direct, and this is like without with in linear interpolation. So it's a very easy way with just one function, so you're making it a lot smoother. And then you could add a lot of more other CSS, CSS things, because you have full access to your SVG with CSS. So you could add things like CSS hover animations. You could give different elements different colors. You could add click listeners on different elements. And more adva advanced options would be to add Rx. That's what David Kirschit talks about a lot. And then when you move your mouse outside the window, if you use Rx, it would keep animating because it takes these event events um, asynchronously, asynchronously. I can't say the word. OK. So this is another example I animated. So here I added a click listener on this on this rocket, and it's like very f fun and playful. And it was also just a drawing and illustration I made, and it wasn't very hard to do. And the next, no, my mouse is locked. Okay. And these are some other ones I did. And why why did I do these drawings? Well. The, the web is very powerful, and using like hobbies and passions you have and connecting them with the web is a really good way to learn. And, and doing fun projects and combining like music or poems or drawing with the web is a very easy way for you to get into technologies you haven't learned yet. And you're very motivated if you connect things you love with, with the web and with the browser. And now there's a lot of new web APIs we can play with. And there's a lot of good talks about them. And we, we can learn in a very simple and easy way by combining these things. And you should always try to find a way to connect your hobbies and what you're passionate about with the web and learn new things. So that was all about drawings and SVG animation. I hope you liked it. Um, you can find out more on my website. I'm on Twitter. And I put all my illustration on an Instagram that's called Lisi Line Art. Thank you. Thank you, Lisi. All right, well done. Let's have a conversation. All right. Um, I thank you so much for just showing the process. It's always great to see how you get from literally nothing to something. It's, um, I think that everybody can benefit from that. Thank you for that. Uh, so animations. Yes. Big deal these days. Everybody's <laughs> talking about animations, transitions, and so on. Um, so it's one thing to design, but how would you go around debugging animations? How do you know if something is a bit too fast, a bit too slow? How do you find that perfect value? What tools do you use for that? So Anna was talking yesterday about the dev tool. So you have the performance tab. You can look at the FPS your animation is running at. And then there's also this very useful um, tab where you can just go through the single frames. And I'd see if like everything works, every frame looks good. And then mostly it's just looking at the animation and getting the right feeling. So it's just a lot of trial and but more on Error. the strategic perspective. So when you're designing an animation, when you even start thinking about designing, a, designing an animation, are there some things that just work for you a lot, where you say this easing function tends to be better for particular cases, or this yeah. thing works better? Can you sort it in shelves for us to reuse? Yeah, so there's in CSS, there's the regular ease in, ease out, but then you can use cubic BCS. 
And so a cubic Bezier for when something is entering the screen would be different to a, a easing function when something is leaving the frame. So you should think about is it entering, is it leaving, and then adapt the easing to like that situation, or is it popping? And then you use all these different easing functions for. Right. There was there was a very nice article by Valhat a while back, and she, I think it was a talk actually, and she mentioned something interesting. So if we, when we have a first visit, when the user has a first visit, yes, we want the experience to be impactful. We're using parallax animations and so on and so forth, um, but. When you visit the page or the site for the fifth time, for the twentieth time, the animation kind of starts getting in the way. So we tend to adapt experiences based on the viewport. Is it also a good idea to adapt animations based on the frequency of use of yes, the site? Yes, yes, of course. So you you should always, when you do animations, you should always think about the user. And a lot of people say that good animation is animation you don't actually notice. Because what you said, if you go to a website for the fifth, tenth time, it gets annoying. You don't, like, it takes too long, and it also can take away from time. So you really have to think not only for the first time when you look at it, but like, is it useful to the user? And do I actually need the animation, or can it like, be bad for the user as well? Because animation can also trigger bad things. Like yeah, so, so maybe it would be a good idea I don't know, to uh, reserve impactful animations, I would say, to something like key interactions, like like you heart something on, on uh, Twitter, you yeah. have this bubble, but you don't see many other animations there at the yeah. same time. And Playful. then kind of try to fit out the framework around that. Um, but maybe coming back to SVG for a second, uh, so what are some of the baffling things, like strange things you discovered about SVG, where you thought, OK, or where you just had to figure out, took a lot of time for you to figure out how that worked? SVG has been around for like a long time, since the 90s, 90s, and there's so many powerful things within SVG you can learn, like Sarah Dresner and a lot of other people, they just wrote whole big books on SVG, and it's very powerful. And you can't only do animations, but you can do like masks and filters, and it's a whole own world to explore and to learn about. But once you learn more about it, you can solve a lot of problems in an easier way that you didn't think were possible. So it's very good to learn what you can do with SVG and mm -hmm. how it works. And especially given that we have SVG level two, where uh, there was this fancy new thing, which I was really just amazed. Uh, like that we can use geometric attributes, specify them as style properties. So we can then, for example, if you have a path and you mm -hmm. have a D attribute, you can actually style it with CSS with yes. SVG level two and, and, and other things. Is this something you desperately want to have in SVG, but it's not there? Or something that you're looking forward to? I love like the SV SVG filters, but like it's still very different across browsers. So across browser consistency with SVG is very different because originally also it wasn't designed to be animated. Like they thought we're gonna paint vector graphics, and that's also why SVG animation is kind of complicated. But I would love like more cross-browser consistency, because then it would be easier to, to use animation and to use filters. Because now a lot of people are afraid, I think, to use it, because it's not very consistent in a lot of browsers. Yeah, so let's hope for the best. Yeah. Say, but I think that you and Yuna have a lot in common. You love filters so much. <laughs> oh, you have to, we have to build up something like a Facebook a filters filter love <laughs> group. Oh, OK, we don't use Facebook in Russia. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe if contact a group or something, I don't know. Uh, all right. Thank you so much, Lizzie. Thank you. Well done. Thank you.